The Muhammad Ali George Foreman fight in Zaire will go down not only as one of the greatest boxing matches of the last century, but clearly one of the most dramatic and fascinating sporting events in all history. The two fighters could hardly have been more different. Foreman in those days was an angry young man, mean, brutal, and silent. Ali, on the other hand, seemed to be having the time of his life. He mingled freely with the Africans, joked with reporters, and made himself accessible to almost anyone who wanted an interview. The odds makers were giving Foreman a 3-to-1 and 4-to-1 advantage. Foreman's record was a perfect 40 wins and 0 losses. At the age of 26, he was just entering his prime in strength, stamina, and quickness. Ali, at 32, was not an old man, but he had lost fights to Ken Norton and Joe Frazier, and he seemed to be on his way out. Finally, the fight began. Ali knew from the beginning there was no way he was going to outpunch the stronger, tougher foreman when he was fresh. He initially planned to dance and move and keep Foreman at bay until the later rounds. But Foreman had been prepared for this and had spent much of his training practicing lateral moves that would keep Ali from escaping. Ali realized that his plans for dancing and moving all over the ring were not going to work here. Midway through the second round, Muhammad Ali adjusted, and he began what boxing analysts consider the strangest and the most bizarre boxing strategy in the history of the sport, a strategy now known as rope dope He began to deliberately back himself into the ropes and made few attempts to come off them. For the next six rounds, he'd fight his opponent from the ropes. Now, normally, this is the last thing any boxer would ever do. But in this case, Ali was using the ropes as his friend. Ali began to put his big bony arms up, cover his face with his gloves and his belly with his elbows, and he let Foreman just flail away. But it wasn't all defensive, however. When he saw an opportunity, Ali would stick and jab his opponent with powerful rights and lefts. From time to time, Ali would come off the ropes, fight a bit in the center of the ring, and then retreat back to the ropes once again. And this went on for six rounds. But something was happening during these six strange rounds of fighting. George Foreman was becoming exhausted. Ali was tiring as well, but Foreman was tiring far more. By rounds six and seven, it was obvious that the powerful puncher was punching himself out. And finally, at the end of the eighth round, Ali came off the ropes and did some serious punching of his own. A left and a right, and then another left, followed by a powerful straight right to Foreman's jaw. The exhausted Foreman was knocked to the canvas the very first time in his career. And after a ten count, Muhammad Ali had won the fight. Ali could never have defeated George Foreman in the first couple of rounds. His opponent was far too strong. Had Ali determined to stand toe-to-toe and slug it out with Foreman in those early rounds, he would surely have been beaten badly. But the wily veteran fighter determined to reserve his strength and sting his opponent where he could and allow time to pass. His plan worked to perfection. What he could never have done in the first round, he accomplished beautifully in the eighth. Time was on his side. Every bell that rang, every wild roundhouse punch that Foreman threw and missed, every step Ali took backwards toward the ropes, every blow to the face he blocked with his long, bony arms was bringing him closer and closer to his desired end. And when it was over, it was the older Ali that the crowds cheered as winner, while George Foreman walked back to his dressing room, stunned and unable to believe he had seen his first defeat. What a powerful lesson in spiritual warfare. Peter tells us our adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To make matters worse, our enemy is stronger than us, smarter than us, more cunning than us, and he's been around for a long time perfecting his craft. Satan and his demons have destroyed ministries, divided families, plagued people with sickness and disease, annihilated marriages, alienated friends, and split churches. 
For this reason, every believer must become effective in spiritual warfare. To use Paul's language, we must take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Every Christian who knows the Bible accepts this, but one of our problems is we don't always plan for lengthy contests. In our minds, the victory should be ours after we've prayed our first prayer or claimed our first Bible promise. Now, sometimes this does happen. Often it does not. There'll be times when our adversary is far too tough, far too strong, and considerably too determined for us to be able to conquer him by a single prayer or a quick moment of having someone lay hands on us. In Jesus Christ, the victory is ours for sure. But if you expect that it must always come in the first round, you'll be disappointed and disillusioned. Jesus uses a parable in the Gospel of Luke to remind us that, quote, men always ought to pray and not lose heart. The good news is that your enemy cannot successfully fight with you forever. Christ is too great, the Word of God is too powerful, and the promises of God too sure. And as with Ali, time is our friend. Every day that passes, every promise of Scripture we quote, every praise we offer to our gracious Father, and every season of fasting we endure bring us closer and closer to our breakthrough and victory. Our Lord Jesus has purchased our victory over every attack of the evil one through His cross and His resurrection, but still we must apply that victory through faith and patience. We'll prevail in due time.